<clears throat> well, hello everyone. My name is Aaron Burge and I'm a professor of marine science at Coastal Carolina University in Conway, South Carolina. That's near Myrtle Beach if you've been to this part of the state. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, just thanking the Explore.org project and View Into the Blue, um, also Teens for Oceans and the Frying Pan Tower uh, and Frying Pan Tower's owner Richard Neal for uh, working with me and and together collaboratively on this project. It's been really exciting and I'm looking forward to uh, to sharing some of what we're doing with the with the shark cam and barracuda cam with you guys today. Um, so I guess I'll give you a little bit of a background about what my research is, um, what some of my interests are, and specifically why I'm involved in, in the shark cam um, project. So uh, I have a background in biology. I went to the University of Kentucky and got a bachelor's degree there. Um, Kentucky's kind of landlocked, as you probably know, and so from Kentucky I made my way over to um, the College of William & Mary Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Uh, I worked on my PhD there for several years looking at interactions between um, a bacterium and, and a fish called the striped bass. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see striped bass on these cameras, but that's an important fish uh, a little farther to the north. Um, finished up my PhD there at VIMS and then moved on to a postdoc position at the College of Charleston, which is in Charleston, South Carolina. And I worked at the NOAA Hollings Marine Laboratory while I was there. Um, since 2006, I've been a, an, a, an assistant and then an associate professor of marine science at Coastal Carolina, which I mentioned. Um, here at CCU, there's probably some of my students on watching right now, I hope students. And uh, here at CCU I teach a variety of different classes, but uh, they include uh, marine biology, the ecology of coral reefs, which we teach every year down in Jamaica, and I'll talk a little more about that in a few minutes, and then uh, a diseases and parasites course um, where students really get a, a good introduction to doing research uh, in a variety of different systems regarding parasites and uh, diseases in both fish and invertebrates. Um, as you guys uh, are watching this if you have questions about kind of what's going on with the cameras or um, any of the, the issues associated with the cameras I'll be happy to try and jump in and, and add my two cents as we go. Um, I was involved in the original uh, deployment or installation of these two cameras out at Frying Pan Tower and um, it, it's pretty exciting I mean I have to say that it was, it was really a, a great experience to get to be involved in in helping explore and view into the blue and others uh, get these towers out at the frying get these cameras out at the frying pan tower um, and so as many of you if you're here watching this right now you've probably been watching the camera feeds and it's really amazing the diversity of fish that we're that we're seeing out on the out on the two camera feeds when they're both up and running um, I think I just got a question come in so give me just a second uh, when you helped install the camera did you see any sharks so that's a great question um, and I was hoping somebody was going to ask that. I actually put up a video on YouTube last night. Um, I'm going to copy the link and put it into the uh, chat box here um, on explore.org and so you can check that out. The short answer is yes. We saw a lot of sharks uh, and other big animals while we were doing the camera installation. So the link that I just put up should pop up for you there in just a moment. Um, shows really the area kind of right underneath shark cam. I think at one point it's kind of a rough video because we were moving around a lot but um, you can see part of shark cam um, on the day of installation and as you'll see there were a lot of large animals uh, in the area at the time and I expect that as the waters start to warm up again this spring that we're going to see a lot of uh, large sharks, um, large grouper and, and, and other just really cool uh, fish diversity out there. Um, so while you guys are thinking of other questions, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the research that I do here at, at Coastal um, and specifically at, as relates to, to the camera installations out at uh, Frying Pan. So um, since 2008, I really kind of in 2008, I got interested in using underwater video to look at fish assemblages. Um, you can probably see the poster behind me on the wall. Um, that poster kind of represents a lot of the common species that are of sort of commercial and recreational importance in the fishery here locally and that's also a lot of the same fish that you're seeing on the cams if you're watching them pretty regularly. So back in 2008 I started working with a couple of guys, Jim Atack and Craig Andrews, 
um, and we got some funding from North Carolina Sea Grant to, to go out onto the continental shelf in the area of Frying Pan Tower uh, and look at using video, underwater video, to, to really kind of get a better understanding of what populations of fishes are like out on these hard bottom habitats. It may not be obvious directly from, um, from the shark cam in particular, but the area directly under shark cam is what we call a hard bottom. And so this is an area where there's a lot of life. Um, that, that hard bottom habitat is, it's kind of like a coral reef in a sense. It has a different kind of geological and biological background, but these areas really serve as magnets to, to bring um, animals that attach directly to the rock to the area, and then the, the fish and, and other invertebrates that are gonna feed directly on them. So I saw another question just popped up, so let me read that real quick and I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, what are the odds that we may see a great white at Frying Pan Tower? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I hope that, that something like that happens. And, and I think that it's, the odds are decent, let me say that. Um, as you're probably aware, there's been a, a project initiated by OSEARCH over the last few years that's been putting um, tracking tags on large, uh, large pelagic predators like great whites. There are a couple of great whites that have been in the vicinity of Frying Pan Tower over the last year since they've been tagged, and it really wouldn't surprise me if, um, if one day we do catch one on, on one of the tower cams. I think it's highly likely, especially this summer once the, the waters really warm up, that, um, that we're going to see a tiger shark or maybe even more than one. Uh, tiger sharks are relatively common in the area, and I've seen them out around Frying Pan Tower over the years, and I think it's likely that uh, that if you're watching on some maybe warm June afternoon, you may see a, a tiger shark swim by. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's going to happen and give us an opportunity to, to uh, learn a little bit more about their behavior underwater. Um, so as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I, I did help with the installation of the, uh, the original tower cams out there. And um, I posted a video there a second ago that, that some of you may be clicking over to on YouTube to look at kind of what the environment immediately around the tower looks like. Uh, another question just came in. Uh, what do sand tiger and sandbar sharks eat? Well, that's, that's a good question. The, um, those are by far the, the two most common species. In fact, they're the only two species of sharks that I'm aware of that we've seen so far on the, on the tower cams. Uh, sand tigers and sandbars typically are going to feed on fish. So, as you guys are seeing on the on the cams themselves, there are lots and lots of fish out there. Um, these two species of, of sharks are probably feeding on a lot of the same fish that you're seeing swimming in front of the camera. Now, this time of year, because the water temperatures are lower than they are uh, during the summer, we're probably not going to see predation events nearly as often as we would when the water's um, a little bit warmer later in the year. So. Since uh, I'm getting a few questions here, let me. I wanted to post another link. Uh, if people are interested, give me just a second and I'll pull that up. I've got um, another YouTube link here that I wanted to share with you guys that you can go on over to that and see what it looks like. I'll post that down here in the comments for you. <clears throat> and this link will take you to some of the, uh, some of the, what was actually occurring when we were installing the cameras. The, um, the actual installation itself happened back at the end of August, and uh, August 31st, as I recall. And so this, this is showing Jim Atak, who I mentioned earlier, and I uh, moving the shark cam from the bottom adjacent to the tower over to the, to the uh, stanchion that it's attached to, and then a few seconds of uh, actually attaching that onto the tower. So take a look at that. Um, pretty cool video. And, it's a rough cut, but it gives you a sense of kind of what the conditions are like out there on a, um, on a nice summer day. If you've been watching the cameras recently, of course, you've been seeing that the, the water clarity is pretty bad. It's murky and green at the moment. We've had a lot of storms in the last, uh, well, about two weeks now, and we've got another one kind of coming today um, that have really stirred up the water and made it a lot more difficult to enjoy the fish swimming by. Um, so I was kind of mentioning some of the, the research that I've been doing over the last few years, um, and I'll send you another link via the comments in just a second. But uh, I first kind of got interested in, in using underwater video, and as I mentioned, kind of in the area around Frying Pan Tower several years ago, um, working with Jim and, and Craig Andrews, we put together this project to basically put stationary underwater video at a variety of different locations around Frying Pan Tower um, within 20 miles or so, both north and south of the tower. 
and uh, we worked on that project for about eight months, collecting video of these these natural habitats, with the ultimate goal being um, to to go out and use those videos to give us some insights on the populations of grouper that that inhabit those areas. As some of you are probably aware, grouper are really important for um, commercial and recreational fisheries in addition to their ecological role. And so we wanted to use underwater video to see if they, we could use a non-extractive way to look at grouper populations. So I just got another question that's popped up here, so let me, let me share that with you guys. Uh, it says, does the tower structure create a different ecosystem than the surrounding areas? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I hope some of my students are actually asking me these questions. These are great. Um, so the tower itself, really, uh, it's, it's a really interesting area. So the, the physical structure that is the tower is, is placed there because it's a, a topographic high. Um, that it's about 35 miles offshore, and as you might guess, most of the surrounding water is significantly deeper than where the, the actual tower is positioned itself. Um, Frying Pan Tower, which you can visit if you want, um, Richard Neal, who I mentioned earlier, owns the tower, and he actually will uh, have visitors out on the tower. It's really amazing. Um, I was lucky to get to go out there for the camera installation. And, if you're into adventure uh, adventure travel, you might really want to go check it out. Uh, I'll post a link to Frying Pan Tower here in a few minutes. But uh, the tower itself, it does create um, kind of a different uh, a different habitat, if you will. So mo in most of the surrounding area, there is uh, well, it's it's mostly sand. Um, as you travel around over that kind of plain of sand on the continental shelf, what you see are these little oases of life that are. Um, we call them hard bottoms or live bottoms. Um, some people call them reefs, but these kind of areas of higher relief, anywhere from just a few inches of, of rock outcroppings to, in some cases, a couple of meters, uh, six to seven feet of relief, those areas um, represent really, really rich habitat for fish to be out in the area around Frying Pan Tower. And it just so happens, not coincidentally, that Frying Pan Tower itself is sitting on one of these ledges. If you check out the YouTube links that I posted a, a few minutes ago on, on the uh, chat board below Shark Cam, uh, you can see what that surrounding area really looks like. So there was natural habitat there that's important for fish diversity in the area. But then when the tower came in in the, in the 1960s, um, it added a lot more three-dimensional relief. So if you ever get the chance to travel out to Frying Pan Tower or something like it, um, what you see is that that three-dimensional structure that the legs and, and infrastructure of the tower represent uh, is a real magnet for, for life. Um, around the tower legs itself, of course, you guys are seeing what's there on the video. But if, if we were to get a little closer to the actual structure and see what are the little critters that live um, in and amongst and, and attached to the tower legs, that's kind of a self-perpetuating system. Those legs serve as additional habitat for, for benthic creatures and other attached animals. Um, they, in turn, serve as, as places to hide for even larger animals. And then all of that becomes food source for the, the more roving assemblage of fish and invertebrates that you're seeing on the towers at any one time. Um, I'll pull up a, another link here. Oh, I just had another question come in. So let me take a look at that and see what... Uh, if I can give you a good answer for that one. So the question was, are the seas always so rough this time of year? Um, yeah, we. I was talking to uh, a couple of people involved in the project over the last week or so. Uh, as you may be aware, the Barracuda Cam, the shallow water camera, which is moored about 10 feet or so from the water surface, um, basically broke. We, uh, we've had kind of a, a malfunction with the camera because the seas have been so rough. And this time of year, yeah, the sea conditions are really bad, um, kind of on average this time of year in the winter, uh, February probably being about the worst seas that we see consistently over the course of the year, unless we have a hurricane. So that's really made it impossible for us to get um, out to Frying Pan Tower to fix Barracuda Cam, get it repositioned and resecured safely um, so that we can turn that live feed back on and hopefully not have the equipment be damaged um, during, during the time that it's being sloshed around by the large waves that you're seeing out there. Uh, another question that just came in, what are the schools of small fish that we see so often on the cam? So that's great. Um, there's really one species of fish that is by far the most common one. If you've been watching some of the camera feed uh, over the, the days or weeks before I'm talking to you today, uh, if you're seeing kind of a long 
uh, long skinny fish who might be about four to six inches in length and they are almost always in schools. Uh, that's a, a fish species called Decapterus punctatus, most likely that one. Um, Decapterus, the uh, common name for those are scads, and they're actually related, they are a jack. They're related to the amberjack, the really large fish that you see swimming by. And uh, the common name for these guys besides scads is cigar minnows. So if you're a fisherman uh, or you've ever gone out deep sea fishing before, um, you may have used cigar minnows for bait. So they're a really common um, schooling jack that's, that occurs often around structure and over the continental shelf and is a really important forage species for the larger predators that are in the area. If you were to look in, at the stomach contents of this amberjack that swim by or the large grouper that you occasionally see on the, on the tower cam, they're probably packed with those uh, scads or cigar minnows that are swimming by in big clouds in front of the camera. Um, and really that kind of gets to the point of what, what is that assemblage of fish out there? I mean, I, I had a great question just a couple of minutes ago about does the tower structure create habitat for the fish that are out there? And it, and it certainly does. One reason why the small scads or cigar minnows that you're seeing so many of are there is because of that three-dimensional structure. Uh, that particular species of fish feeds on plankton. And in fact, if you watch the cameras when they're in view, you'll often see them kind of like tilt. Um, they'll tip their nose up a little bit. And what they're actually doing is selecting plankton out of the water column. The plankton are too small for us to see, but they can see them and they're sipping them in as they swim by in large schools. A uh, question just came in, why aren't you using filters on the cam to improve the colors? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'd have to say that I, I don't know. Um, my guess is that it's related to how the cameras are designed or the way in which they turn within the housing. Uh, you also, of course, are going to run into the problem that a filter um, on a stationary camera, the light conditions are going to be changing as the day progresses or um, as it goes from, from day to night. And so the, the uh, usefulness of those filters will go down. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure. That's a, a good question. And maybe I can pass that one on to the camera developer uh, and ask him, ask him the answer to that one. Um, so I'll post a link for you guys. I've got it here just a second if you'll bear with me. Um, pull this one up. And this, this link is going to show a little bit of some of the work that we've been doing over the years uh, in the wider area. Um, around, I mentioned this earlier, around Frying Pan Tower are these, these really important natural hard bottoms. Frying Pan Tower itself is built on one of these natural hard bottoms. Um, but the, the, uh, the surrounding area really in that whole region of the continental shelf uh, has these natural reefs. And so if you check out the video that I just posted, uh, it's called Swimming Through a Natural Aquarium. And this was a video that we put together with some of the, what, what I consider the highlights of the project that where we were using a, a stationary underwater video that we would move from location to location to look at fish populations on different hard bottoms um, in and around the, the immediate frying pan tower area. Uh, as you watch through the video, you'll see a map actually of where Frying Pan Tower is in relation to the coast uh, if you were curious about where it is. Uh, let's see here. So I just got a question pop up. What are some of the common invasive parasites in Frying Pan? So that's kind of a tough one. I, I do work um, on parasites on both in marine fish and in, in freshwater fish. I've been mostly working with uh, kind of small marine fish parasites over the year, over the last few years, um, specifically related to some of the classes I teach. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure about invasive parasites per se, but there is, you're probably aware, um, an invasive species of uh, fish that's really important on, on these hard bottom ecosystems uh, that frying pan tower is representative of, uh, and that's, of course, the lionfish. Um, if, if you're watching this tower cam, you probably know a little bit about lionfish because it's, it's such an issue of, of concern for people that, that care kind of about, uh, well, ocean health in a broad sense. Um, now, personally, I've never seen lionfish directly under the tower, but uh, they should be there. And I know that if we were to go around, and if you watch uh, some of the videos I've been posting, the habitat, that natural hard bottom habitat, is actually perfect habitat for lionfish. Uh, and we see very large individual lionfish out on these hard bottom habitats, in addition to large aggregations of them. Uh, off the 
off the area that is frying pan tower, you're going to see just, I, I mean, it's amazing how many lionfish you'll see. Uh, I remember one dive that I did a couple of years ago during the summer where we went to a wreck that's kind of east of frying pan tower. And within about 20 feet or so of the anchor line on that wreck, I could see 50 lionfish. All of them were really big. Um, so it's just amazing how they've really proliferated in the area. Um, and then, as you may be aware, they've spread really over the entire western tropical Atlantic. So a couple more questions have come in. Uh, so let me take a look at those. Uh, well, this is a good one. So why have we seen almost no predation on the cams? Uh, do most of the predators feed at night? So th those are great questions. Um, I've been wondering about this myself, and I, I know from doing some work on coral reefs down in Jamaica where we were actually hoping to document lionfish predation on native coral reef fish, um, that it's actually rare, a lot more rare than you might, might guess, uh, to catch a predation event on camera. Uh, despite what we see on things like uh, National Geographic or the Discovery Channel where uh, they, they show predation in the wild, the, the people who are getting those videos are spending, I, I can't even begin to guess how many hours trying to document those types of events. So I have seen one predation event on frying, on the uh, shark cam. It was a couple of weeks ago, and um, it was, I guess maybe I could say more the aftermath of a predation event, a, um, a fish called the Spanish hogfish. If you watched much of the camera feed, you've probably seen the Spanish hogfish. It's, uh, it's oh, six, eight, ten inches long. Uh, bright yellow and it has kind of underwater it looks like a gray kind of uh, saddle across its back uh, and a pointy nose. So a yellow fish with kind of a gray saddle that that saddle is actually uh, purple but underwater it appears gray. Uh, one of those which they're relatively common on this this camera feed swam up to the camera uh, with a large well large for the fish uh, crab in its mouth. So it had probably just plucked that crab maybe even from the base of the camera housing. Uh, and it swam by. But yeah, I've, I've been wondering about seeing some predation events on the cam. Um, the second part of your question was, do most of the predators feed at night? Now, nighttime or what we would call crepuscular feeding, crepuscular means kind of in dawn and dusk, um, feed for some species of fish that those time periods are very important. Um, but we should be seeing predation events at some point. Um, so it could be related to the time of year or to the fact that the, the fish they're just not feeding that, uh, that at that high of a frequency that we're catching it on the camera. I mean, you have to remember that the camera is seeing a relatively limited field of view. So um, catching a predation event, it will happen, I think, but it's not that common yet. So another question has just popped up. Uh, what makes lionfish so detrimental to ecosystems? So these are, these are great questions, by the way. You guys um, keep them coming, please. So um, I've done some work on lionfish primarily down in, in the Caribbean where they're a lot more accessible than they are off the coast of North Carolina, although they've been off the coast of the Carolinas for a lot longer than they have been in the Caribbean. Um, the prevailing wisdom, I haven't really done this type of work myself directly, but I'm familiar with it. The prevailing wisdom is that lionfish, uh, because they're generalist predators, uh, meaning that they'll feed basically on anything that they can, that they can get in their mouths. Uh, for example, I've seen lionfish with fish that were almost the same size as themselves sticking out of their mouths, swimming around on the reef down in Jamaica. Uh, and so because they can feed on such a wide array of different prey species, uh, that, that makes most species that are of their size range vulnerable to predation. It also has to do with what we would call their life history. So life history kind of describes um, how an animal makes its living. Uh, in the case of lionfish, they, they have a strategy that we call R selection. Um, not to get technical about it, but basically R selected species put more effort or more energy, the better term, more energy into reproduction than they do into growth. So we can look at a fish like a lionfish, and um, you've probably heard that they can reproduce at a really rapid rate. So they feed heavily, and instead of growing bigger and bigger and bigger, they put that energy into reproducing more quickly, uh, more eggs. And, and more baby lionfish out on the reefs. So the combination of a generalist predator and one who puts most of its, um, most of its energy into reproduction really has set the stage for this fish to be successful um, in a variety of different habitats uh, that are really just united by having warm water uh, and ample food. So these are great questions. Please, please do keep them coming. Uh, related to lionfish, 
I wanted to share, if I can find it here, um, I've got a list of things I was going to put up for you guys. <coughs> Another uh, a video link here that shows some of the research, or actually, not really research in this in this sense, but basically our interactions with lionfish down in Jamaica. I mentioned earlier that we see lionfish quite uh, frequently on the on the off the coast of North Carolina, uh, and in the vicinity of Frying Pan Tower. Uh, but because of how far offshore that that area is for us, it's really difficult to get out there to do active research. Um, most of the the research on lionfish that's occurring kind of in the in the in North and South Carolina is actually happening up in uh, Beaufort, North Carolina with the NOAA lab and a bunch of researchers up there that are really interested in looking at um, the impacts of lionfish on local fish populations. So if you check out the link I just posted in the uh, the cam comments there below where you're looking at me, uh, you can see some of what we've been doing down in Jamaica to understand the impacts of lionfish on coral reef fishes, um, which some of what you see on the tower cams are actually a subset of those coral reef fishes. So that's a good segue. I did want to point out um, some of the work that we're doing more specifically with the tab, with the, with with the shark and barracuda cams out at Frying Pan Tower. So uh, oh, since we since these were installed uh, back at the end of the summer, um, myself and others have been talking about some of the research opportunities that the cameras really represent. I mean, if you're watching this feed today, you're probably interested in the cams because it's like looking at an aquarium, right? You get to see amazing animals in their natural habitat, uh, and, and that's great. I mean, that's one of the things that really excites me about this project. But I'm also looking at it from the point of view of a scientist, and so what the camera installations really represent from that perspective is an opportunity for us to look at quantitatively what, what fish are present out at Frying Pan Tower, um, how, do that, how do those fish assemblages change in terms of the species richness or the abundance of animals over the course of say seasonal changes um, and things like that and so we're starting up a couple of projects here at Coastal Carolina University uh, where I'm working with students to to really data mine the footage that's coming to you that you're seeing on explore.org uh, to look at the fish community and how it can change through through time um, sort of in the longer term, we're hoping to to get some more sophisticated scientific instruments too out of the tower uh, that can allow us to to look at influences like meteorological influences or current influences, the movement of water um, on the fish community over both short-term scales and long-term scales. So, really, the the tower itself and our uh, the the generous generous access that we've had to Frying Pan Tower is going to allow us to, to really answer some important scientific questions about fish communities um, on these really cool habitats, these hard bottom habitats that we've mentioned. Uh, so I see another couple of questions have popped up. Um, next one, oh, it looks like a couple more questions on lionfish, that's great. So uh, the next question was, do lionfish have any predators in their invasive water or in their invasive range? Uh, and what eats them in their native waters? This is a great question, and it's been um, an, a question of scientific interest for, for quite some time about um, how this invasive fish got over here and then whether any of the native predators are, um, are actually feeding on lionfish. So this, this has been debated um, for a while, and I know that there are, are a few instances where people have seen um, lionfish, for example, in the, in the guts of large grouper. So it's, it's certainly possible that uh, fish like grouper, large snapper, um, some of the predatory sharks that you may be seeing on the camera feeds, um, and, and fish like that, primarily piscivorous fish, uh, may actually be feeding on, on lionfish themselves. I've seen down in the Caribbean um, triggerfish feed on lionfish. Um, there was a photograph that was circulating uh, last year of a bird an osprey that actually caught a lionfish. So there are some predators that feed on them, but it, it appears to be primarily a learned behavior. So for example, in Belize, some of the operator, the dive operators in Belize have been um, working to, to get lionfish off their reefs by training the local grouper, uh, in some cases even sharks, to, to actively seek out and hunt lionfish. And they've been doing that by, by spearing lions and then releasing them uh, in front of the predator and kind of getting the predators used to feeding on those, those injured fish. Uh, whether or not that's going to make a dent in the population remains to be seen. 
Um, but the second part of the question was, what eats them in their native waters? Well, that's a great question too. There's really only one paper uh, in the scientific literature that, that discusses uh, a single predator on lionfish. It's likely, uh, and that fish is called a cornet fish actually. The cornet fish um, we do have in the Atlantic as well as in the native range for lionfish in the Pacific. Um, but my guess is, given what a cornet fish looks like, they look like um, a long skinny tube and they have kind of a small mouth. My guess is that they feed naturally on small lionfish, not on the adults that we're seeing, or the larger adults that we're seeing here in the Atlantic. Um, in their native waters, it's certainly plausible to believe that, that uh, the same fish that, that are beginning to eat them in the Atlantic, again, large grouper, large snapper, sharks and, and trigger fish, for example, are going to feed on them in their native range too. Um, one of the things that's kind of a, a related issue to predation on lionfish is, is the fact that in many cases fish populations are overfished. Uh, and so we of course when we fish we typically target large individuals within a species or a complex of species of interest. Uh, and those larger individuals are the ones that are often the most fit in terms of their predation ability, their ability to reproduce and so on. So it's really um, it's a complicated issue. Uh, another another question just came up. Uh, <laughs> so somebody must have clicked over to the lionfish video that I put up where we were um, we were showing the the harvesting that we were doing down in Jamaica a few years ago, and uh, the person asked they were curious if I've ever been stung by a lionfish. I I have. Uh, it's not something that that I enjoyed, and it's not something I would recommend to anybody. Um, I've been stung once badly and three other times uh, very minorly. Um, the bad sting, it ruined my day, I'll put it that way. It actually happened out near Frying Pan Tower, um, and I had speared a really large lionfish, and uh, in the process of tucking it into the bag um, to get it off the spear, I, I jammed it into my own hand. So that's how most people get stung is um, when they're actually out there actively harvesting lionfish, they, they end up poking themselves. Uh, yeah, but I don't recommend it. Um, so another question just came up. Oh, this is great. Is there anything we as viewers can do to help make the data mining from the video archives more effective? That That's really a great, great question. Um, I've been given some thought to how can we involve the community. Those of you that are watching right now are that community. Um, you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in the cameras. So, um, yeah, I, I think... Um, one thing certainly that you can be doing, and, and you're already some of you are already doing this, is posting screenshots uh, is actually really helpful because I've been using just the comment, the, the posted screenshots in, in the, uh, the comment section for the cameras to get a sense of what species we need to be focusing on. For example, if there's 10 of you or 50 or 100 or 1,000 of you, obviously you're going to be a lot more able to, to watch more of the video than I am. Um, I couldn't. I would love to just kind of sit and watch them, but I can't. I can't do that all day. I have to do a lot of other things. So um, keep keep that up. Posting those screenshots is is really important because you're going to see the rare fish, or you're going to see the rare turtle that swims by, and that gives us the opportunity then to go back in and look uh, look in particular for that species, but also to look um, whether or not the same individual might be showing up on the camera. Uh, I've seen from following the comments over the last few months um, that there's a, uh, what's it called, the spot tail pinfish. It's one that you guys see a lot of. Uh, the, the scientific name is Diplodus. It's the gray kind of roundish fish with a black tail, really common on the cameras. And there's one that has a chunk taken out of its back. And I've seen several people mention that the, that particular individual fish swam by the camera again. I've seen that fish myself. Um, to so to get back to that question, is there anything that, that you as viewers can do to help um, with this effort? I'm thinking about it. So maybe we could trade contact information. Um, I'm pretty easy to find. You have my name now. Uh, and so if you are interested, maybe send me an email or a message and uh, we can talk about ways that you might be able to get involved. I will say that, again, please keep posting those, um, those screenshots. They're immensely helpful. And uh, just Earlier last week, one of my students emailed me, very excited. Maybe he's watching this right now. Uh, he caught pictures of a loon, a bird, on the Barracuda cam before it went offline. I scrolled back through the uh, the comments from from that day's video, and somebody else had caught 
the foot of that loon swimming by and was asking what it was. So that's that type of stuff gives us pointers or, or information to, to go forward and say, okay, here's a rare fish that we haven't seen very much of. We can go back into the footage and learn more about what it's doing. <clears throat> so let's see here. A lot of you guys are probably wondering about... Um, as we go forward what some of the plans out at Frying Pan Tower are. Um, and this is this is something that those of us that are involved in, in the in the Explore project with Mew Into the Blue and Teens for Ocean and Frying Pan Tower, this is something that we've been talking about a lot uh, over the last weeks and months. So um, one of the things that's that's kind of on the on the horizon that I'm really excited about is we're we're looking for partners and funding to um, to look at putting some more instrumentation out at Frying Pan Tower that would interface with the cameras. Uh, specifically, we're looking for uh, looking to install some acoustic receivers out at the tower that would allow us uh, to track fish as they move kind of away from the tower and then back into the vicinity of the tower. Uh, really quickly, basically what we can do is we can implant tracking devices, acoustic tracking devices, into larger animals like some of the sharks that you're seeing or some of the large uh, fish that are in the area, and then use both the cameras and the acoustic tracking um, instrumentation to look at how those animals utilize the habitat that Frying Pan Tower represents, and then the larger area out in the uh, the vicinity of the tower. And again, if you want to check out what the area around the vicinity of the tower looks like, if you scroll down through the comments that are um, popping up here slowly on on the uh, the Shark Cam feed down in the comments section, I've posted a few videos of what the area around that location looks like. Um, related to a question that we got a little bit earlier, I, I don't think I've mentioned yet uh, about getting the community involved. One, one thing that um, I want to encourage you guys to keep doing is to keep posting these screenshots. And so uh, my students and I, in my marine biology lecture class this semester, uh, some of the students and I are putting together what, what we're calling a pictorial guide to the fishes of Frying Pan Tower. So we're using the camera feeds, we're capturing still images off the camera feeds just like you guys have been posting, and we're putting together just a little fact sheet about what each of those species, um, what it's called, uh, what its scientific name is, what, what larger group of fish does it belong to, so what family is it in, and then a link to more information. Um, every day when I check in on the, uh, the comment board, I'm amazed at the pictures that you guys are getting. So along the way, I'll probably be grabbing some of your better pictures, with, with attribution, of course, um, and putting them into the pictorial guide, pictorial guide as well. Um, once that's done, and once we have a good coverage of the species that are relatively common on the camera, uh, I'll get in touch with Explore about sharing that with them, and hopefully they'll be able to, uh, to provide that as a resource for you guys out on the camera. Out on the camera feed, I should say. Um, <clears throat> so we're getting, let's see here. Oh, no new questions have popped up in the, in the last few minutes. Um, I see that one of the moderators is, is uh, encouraging you guys to, to keep taking those screenshots. They are really helpful. Um, moving forward, of course, they, they just become more and more helpful. So uh, you're going to see rarer fish as the seasons change, and I think those of you that are really actively looking at the cameras now are going to be amazed at what you're going to see over the summer. Um, the diversity is going to go up. Right now I think we're running around 30 or so species that are relatively common. Uh, what you're going to see in the, in the summertime is that may, that may double. Um, we may see many, many more species as the, the water's warm. Uh, I know just from going back into the archived footage earlier in the fall when the water was still really warm that, that we received a lot more species diversity. So that's pretty exciting, and uh, that really, I think, tells us why, uh, a lot about why this is such an important and interesting habitat. One of the, uh, one of the pictures that popped up, I think just today, uh, there were a couple of people that posted still images or screenshots of a fish that I've never seen in the wild before, um, and I, I think that's a blue line tile fish. I've seen a couple of pictures over the last month or so of uh, what looked like a blue line tile fish to me. Uh, at Frying Pan Tower, so that's pretty exciting. Like I said, that's a that's a species I've never seen in the wild, so uh, it's pretty cool to get to see them on the Explore.org camera. Um, trying to think of some other things that I can share with you guys as uh, we wait for some more questions to come in. Oh, I will point your attention. I mentioned earlier that I helped with the initial um, 
installation of these cameras and what a cool opportunity that was for me. Um, I was also involved back in December with, with an installation that's not nearly as complex as this one, uh, but was down in Acamal, Mexico. And so if, if you're interested, head over to the Teens for Oceans uh, website, which is one of the partners on the shark cam that you guys are watching. I'll post a link to it in the comments section up here for you. If you head over there, uh, they have a, a series of webcams that are streaming on, on, their, um, on their website. And that the, the specific project that I was helping with down in Acamal, Mexico, was in a, in a bay down there uh, where green sea turtles are relatively common. And there's an underwater camera there that I'm really hoping that I'm going to see a green sea turtle on here pretty soon. So that one, you could go check that one out and uh, you might see a sea turtle swim by. So it looks like another question's just popped up. Let me read that real quick. Uh, the question is about invasive species. So are there any other invasive species that we may, may see on the cameras uh, or on the Cayman cam uh, or any of the other Caribbean cams? So. I know that on the Cayman cam, I haven't watched that one as much as I have the frying pan cam because, well, because this is where I live and I helped with the frying pan one. But uh, the Cayman cam, I believe that they've seen some lionfish um, moving through the area. In terms of fish, that's by far the most likely invasive fish that you're going to see. Um, there are a few other invasive fish in the Atlantic that occur in warm tropical waters, but to my knowledge, they, they really haven't spread and haven't become abundant like, um, like lionfish have. And, um, but there are other invasive species that you may see, uh, other invasive invertebrates that are possible to see, like on the Cayman cam. There is an invasive species at Frying Pan Tower that we don't really see it on the camera because it doesn't move, but that's actually a really large barnacle. Um, it's called the Titan Barnacle, Megavalinus. This one, if you, if you kind of know what a barnacle looks like, they're often quite small. Uh, on the order of a centimeter or less, like a quarter inch or so, or a half an inch. Uh, Mega Balanus can be two inches long. It's a much, much larger barnacle. It's bright pink. It's pretty readily apparent, and I've seen them growing on the legs of Frying Pan Tower when we've been out there doing work. Um, another question just popped up. So, will we see more sea turtles on Frying Pan Tower Cam this summer? I, I think so. Um, I did see somebody posted a screenshot at the end of the summer, or early in the fall, I should say, um, of a loggerhead turtle. I didn't see that one kind of in real time, if you will. But uh, yeah, I, I expect that we will, especially on the Barracuda Cam, it's likely that we'll see an occasional turtle. Um, immediately in the vicinity, and this again gets to the sort of larger habitat that's out there just around the tower, um, the ledges, those, those rocky kind of craggy uh, habitats that make up this larger hard bottom habitat. Those ledges are really important foraging areas for not just loggerhead turtles, but other species of sea turtles as well. And it's quite common for us to see um, turtles asleep under the ledge. So you're swimming by, you see something that's kind of smooth and a little unusual, you swim up to investigate what it is, and it turns out to be a really large adult turtle sleeping on the bottom wedged under the, under the ledge. So as those individuals move from kind of resting and foraging areas on live bottom back up toward the surface, where I think we're very likely to get to see um, get to see sea turtles on the on the shark or the barracuda cam. So that's a good question. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to share with you guys another link. I, I mentioned this at the beginning in the thanks, and this is the link to Frying Pan Tower. So you might, um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Frying Pan Tower, the structure itself, uh, there's a little section on the history of Frying Pan Tower, um, some of the opportunities that are available out at the tower, and, and, um, and just what it looks like. So Richard Neal, the, uh, the owner of Frying Pan Tower, has some cool stuff up, up, up on that website. And again, that, the tower itself represents the physical structure that's supporting the camera infrastructure. Um, and it's really a magnet for everything that we're seeing around the cameras. So it's pretty cool. Um, there's one thing I wanted to return to that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I posted several video links and I'd encourage you guys to, to go and check those out um, and really just to, to congratulate you for being interested in, in what Explore is showing on these cameras and to try and translate some of that interest into, um, into ocean advocacy. I mean, part of, part of the point here is that this is a way for people who maybe don't live near the oceans or 
or um, don't have the ability to get out there and see what it's really like for, for you to get involved in, in ocean related issues. And I, I think that if you're here, you're probably already interested, but you might talk to your family or friends about uh, issues kind of facing the oceans, ocean health, generally speaking, um, and encourage them to do what they can to help because every little bit can make a difference. Um, hopefully a few more questions will come in. We've got just a couple of minutes left here, I think, in the talk. And um, I'd love to talk to you more about some of the things that or answer some of the questions that you may have about what's going on out at Frying Pan Tower. Since this is kind of asynchronous, I can't see you, but you can see me. I can't sit here and be quiet waiting for you to talk, waiting for you to ask. So bring the questions on. I can share a little bit more detail about um, some of the other camera work that we've done out at Frying Pan Tower. Uh, I mentioned earlier that um, I posted a link for, for the still video project where we looked at grouper populations. Um, but I just got a question, so let me take a look at that real quick. Ah, this is a good one. This is something that I've been thinking about. So the first part of the question is, are most of the sharks that we're seeing the same individual sharks? And I think that that is a really great question. And, and like I said, I've had the same question myself. I know that earlier in the year there was a large um, female sandbar shark, which the sandbars, if you're not really familiar with what they look like, they're the ones that are really prototypically sharky. They look fast and they look kind of scary. Uh, the other main species of shark that you're seeing on the camera, the sand tiger, um, they're, they're scary looking too. They have big teeth, but uh, they, they move much more sluggishly where the sandbar shark is moving very aggressively, so to speak, through the water column. Uh, so we saw a sandbar shark earlier on the camera feed that, that actually had a torn dorsal fin. It had a chunk taken out of its dorsal. Uh, and I was wondering if we would see that individual again. And at least to my knowledge, I didn't see it again. But to get to your question, it, it's very likely that a lot of the individual sharks that we're seeing, especially the sand tiger sharks, um, that those are resident or at least resident part of the year out at Frying Pan Tower. Um, typically this time of year when the water cools significantly, um, sand tiger sharks kind of aggregate on structures that, that provide them with food and um, they're like meeting places. So most likely some of the individuals that we're seeing out there um, are, if not resident, at least frequent visitors to the area. With the sandbars, um, I don't know necessarily uh, about any individuals, but it is likely that we're seeing uh, that we're seeing the same individuals time after time over short periods of time and then they may move off. Uh, as the water's warm, I expect back in the spring, I expect that um, we'll see a lot more transient fish, sharks and, and other migratory fish that are moving northward as the water's warm. There was a, a, rela a related question uh, to are we seeing the same individual sharks and that was do they remain in a specific territorial range? So I kind of touched on that. Um, the idea, it, it depends. Uh, within the species itself, some are going to migrate over longer distances and some individuals are going to be more stationary or more ha have a territory of their own. Um, and then the third part of that question is what is the likelihood of seeing other sharks besides sandbar and sand tiger? Uh, so this was something that if you, if you turned it, tuned in in the last few minutes or something, I touched on this earlier. Um, I think that it's highly likely this summer that we're going to see a tiger shark or more than one. Um, tiger sharks are, I don't want to say abundant, but are fairly common out uh, in the area that is that frying pan shoals and frying pan tower represent. And so I think it's really likely that we'll see uh, some tiger sharks later in the summer once the waters have warmed back up to kind of a comfortable level for them. Uh, another question just came in. Do the sharks common to frying pan tower mate near the tower? That's a great question. I have no idea. Um, there are some researchers who look at things like home ranges and, uh, and mating, mating areas, uh, both nursery and mating areas uh, for local shark species, but I'm not familiar with whether or not frying pan would be an area where mating may occur. I do know that on some of the, the hard bottoms in the area that we've seen very, very young tiger sharks. Um, last summer uh, at an area about, I guess it was about 40 miles south of Frying Pan Tower, uh, we saw a, a just tiny baby tiger shark. It was less than two, less than three feet long um, and it was clearly just born. So that, in, that, that mother must have just pupped in the area. So it wouldn't surprise me, especially if pupping 
um, or have birthing the young was occurring out in the area. But as far as mating goes, I don't know. Uh, besides, here's another question that's just come up. Besides frying pan shoals, what other areas would be most interesting for a similar camera setup? That's a really good question. Um, so off the coast, if, if you ever have a chance to kind of explore um, what the bottom looks like, and you can look like on Google Earth and stuff, there are, there are map layers that will show you some of the topography of, of the uh, wider continental shelf in the area. The farther off the coast you get, the more complex the habitat tends to get. So as you move offshore, um, these live bottom ledges that I've mentioned uh, become have greater and greater relief. So if near frying pan we we have big ledges that might be a meter in relief farther offshore, say twice as far or more than twice as far offshore, the relief of some of those ledges may be even greater. So it could be upwards of three meters or more. Um, the more complex the habitat, the more that would be a really desirable place to have a camera. The main kind of um, challenge with doing like the frying pan tower installation is that you got to have infrastructure. Uh, so the, the, the cameras that you guys are watching, they're powered, right? They have power, they have data transmission. So at some random place out in the middle of the ocean, that would be a lot more difficult. Um, there may be other platforms like frying pan tower that would potentially be good places to put towers. I'm sorry, cameras. Um, I got a question here. Are any marine mammals ever seen on the cameras or in the area? Uh, so to, to my knowledge, we have not yet seen a marine mammal on the frying pan tower cameras, but I bet we will. Uh, I know that when we travel back and forth to frying pan tower or in the sort of wider area that that, that portion of the continental shelf represents, that we always see dolphins. Um, and certain species of whales are relatively common if you can use common to describe a whale, but uh, dolphins certainly I expect that over the summer we'll see we'll see dolphins, uh, either migratory ones or ones that are more resident um, on the cameras. So it wouldn't surprise me if they may even come up and interact with the camera, which would be really interesting. Um, looking at themselves in the in the, the shiny part of the camera housing would be pretty cool. Uh, I mentioned earlier for those of you that have stuck around for a while, but to the, to the people that are new, last week one of my students um, caught photograph or screen captures of a bird, a, a loon, who dove down to the Barracuda can uh, and basically took a selfie. If you scroll down through the comments, you'll get to see that. And my guess is that that bird was doing that because it could see its reflection in the camera housing. Uh, a related question to the, the question about dolphins. Would we be able to hear dolphins from a hydrophone? And yeah, yeah, we could. If, if we had the, uh, the instruments to put out at Frying Pan Tower for research, um, if they were tuned correctly, we should be able to hear them with a hydrophone. I haven't done that kind of tracking work where you look at uh, marine mammal movements before with, with hydrophones, but it should be, should be possible. We can hear them underwater when we're scuba diving, so I would expect that you can pick them up with, um, with equipment like that. So there's just a few minutes left in the scheduled time for the talk, so if, um, if there are any additional questions that you've been kind of mulling over over the last, uh, well, hour or so, uh, please get them posted so that I can have a chance to answer you before before I need to go. Um, this has been really great, and um, while you're thinking about your questions, I'll just uh, thank again Explore.org and View Into the Blue and Teams for Ocean and Richard Neal and Frying Pan Tower um, for for this project and for this camera installation. I know that for me, this has been a really exciting research and outreach opportunity to um, to get to be involved in. And for those of you that are out there watching. The cameras are probably, um, well, they're fun. You get to see into a world that you may not have experience with, and um, that's pretty exciting. So I think that that's been a great, great opportunity um, to, to get to collaborate with Explore.org. Um, <clears throat> it looks like I think most of the questions that people were going to gonna ask have been asked. So I'd like to thank you, those of you that, that tuned in today for, for this web chat. And uh, I really appreciate your time to, to come and ask questions and listen to what I have to say about this project. And again, I'll thank Explore.org and View Into the Blue, Teens for Oceans, and Frying Pan Tower uh, for, for this project. It's really amazing. Thanks for your time, and uh, keep posting those screenshots. Thank you.